Welcome everyone. I can see that the participants are starting to arrive. Then we will wait a couple seconds, 26. Uh, I would like to, to wish you a happy new year because this is the first event after Christmas, then it's the first webinar of 2022. And as usual, we will have this webinar every month and it's organized by uh, the WMO Barcelona Das Regional Center, uh, thanks to the collaboration of BSC and IMET. And uh, the platform that we are using for these webinars, as you may know, is the Zoom webinars. And then you will have different ways to gather us. One is the questions and answers box that is in the bottom, also the chat, then you can right in any moment of the webinar and uh, Ernest, Slodovan and myself, we will take care of all of your questions and comments. And then, and then also if there are at the end someone that wants to raise directly the questions to the real speaker, uh, we will upgrade this participant to the panelist and you can also ask questions directly to Mikhail today. And uh, with, this brief introduction, I would like to pass the role, the floor to Ernest Berner, the technical director, oops, sorry, of the Barcelona Das Regional Center and uh, who, the person who will introduce or invite the speaker of today. Then Ernest, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Sara. We have today Michael Schultz. Um, he's a climate scientist uh, with a broad experience in atmospheric science and global climate modeling. Uh, his research interest centers on the role of uh, meteorology, aerosol physics and chemistry, and their interaction for a better understanding of global climate change and air quality problems. He has promoted uh, model development uh, through innovative intercomparisons like the Aerocom aerosol model intercomparison or the CMI P6 Aircam MIPI model intercomparisons. And also uh, he's co leading the climate modeling section at the Norwegian Meteorological Institute. Uh, he has contributed to more than uh, 200 papers and uh, uh, his. Uh, uh, I as I highly cited researcher, for example, and I I wanted to mention also to remark that he has been uh, sharing the Sanandas warning advisory and assessment system of the WMO uh, from 2008 to uh, 2014. Um, well, uh, Michael, if you're ready, you have yes. the floor. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I hope you hear me well. Uh, and uh, I will go through what I thought was maybe interesting to many of you. And uh, thanks for reminding me that I had been in this dust business a bit uh, for some years, uh, cooperating nicely with uh, the Barcelona team on this sand and dust storm warning system. And um, since I went to Norway, dust became a bit far away, a bit farther away. So uh, that was one of the reasons to get a little away from dust. But in Aerocom, uh, dust has always been a, a very uh, prominent uh, part of the research. Uh, as some of you know, that's an initiative which is actually almost 20 years old. And uh, I'm going to feature some recent results, some uh, reflections on dust, uh, and I hope uh, you find it interesting. And uh, I'm interested to get also feedback on what Aerocom should do in the future. So, um, uh, just to move, yeah. Oop. So, Aerosom, Aerocom. Uh, is an open initiative. Uh, it's really a, a group of people interested in global aerosol modeling. And uh, a central goal was always to strengthen the tie with uh, 
uh, with the observational uh, community from satellite ground-based aircraft observations. And to uh, then there was uh, some, some uh, struggle on the name. What does it mean really aerosol model intercomparison or is it an aerosol comparison of models and observations uh, for some time? But uh, as you see, there's also at the AeroCom meetings now always a branch AeroSat, which meets together with AeroCom. Uh, and there is uh, quite a tie with the observations and the modeling community in, the, in that group. So the idea is that uh, AeroCom initiates and coordinates model experiments to target particular research topics, uh, leading to joint papers. And uh, for that purpose, there's a common database at the Norwegian Meteorological Institute, uh, which should facilitate this exploration. A lot of people over the years who have contributed, and uh, uh, this is just a, a review. The infrastructure um, is centered uh, or held at the uh, uh, Norwegian Meteorological Institute. Uh, we have about 50 terabyte data now from the different aerosol model in the comparisons. Uh, and there are, there's a way to register and make use of that database. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you find information on the website how to do that. You have uh, about 300 registered users. Not everybody is using it all the time, but if you're interested to look into dust uh, cycle data from models, I think that's a good start. Uh, there's also a web interface now, a new one, um, which uh, has, for instance, the uh, ref the, the data from this uh, recent uh, reference paper from Bliss et al. in ACP, which, which features the control simulation of the phase three of AeroCom. And you can have different views on these uh, comparisons and picture uh, comparison at sites, uh, across models. Uh, it's a quite um, uh, flexible uh, web interface and um, I'll let you explore that yourself. Uh, on the website, you find information on experiments, uh, events, some publications, and the link to these data and uh, how to contribute. There was also the presentation from the older uh, annual meetings. It's an email list, of course, and, uh, and there's a scientific steering committee. And I've just uh, put in this presentation also the uh, recent publications, um, uh, which uh, show a little the spread of uh, interest uh, from biomass burning to absorption to uh, radiative forcing to uh, comparison with satellites. Um, and then there's a, a branch which is uh, really linked to the uh, climate models, the CMIP-6 models. Uh, we made an effort to, to link better to the models which are used in CMIP-6 through AirCAMMIP. Uh, and a lot of models participating in AeroCom experiments have now also participated in these CMIP-6 experiments so that uh, we understand better what uh, kind of aerosol is actually used in the climate models. Scientific steering committee uh, is uh, composed of uh, Stefan, Sinslong, Mian Chin, Kostas, Björn, Gunnar, Duncan, Eve, and myself. And we have some working groups uh, leading to papers uh, and uh, special acknowledgement here to the, the local team at Metno with Anna, Augustin, Jan, and Jonas, who have uh, who do a lot of uh, work on the server. Um, there's a, a database to maintain, and uh, we have a tool now also to uh, analyze data by Aerocom, which is on GitHub, if you're interested. And uh, I think it's worth to acknowledge all these people who contribute a lot, among others, of course, the modelers uh, who always have been very uh, generous with uh, sharing their results. So I, I chose to, to uh, show you some recent results on dust and then uh, maybe 
uh, get to some selected current activities in the end. Um, so was to show, uh, I thought we are uh, recent uh, results analyzing the size of aerosol of dust, especially doing also comparisons to coarse mode AOD. Um, trends are interesting because they have an impact on um, forcing of aerosol forcing. And whenever you try to analyze aerosol trends, you will have to understand also the trends of dust because they are um, in large parts of the world dominating the AOD trends. And then uh, the absorption of dust uh, is uh, of relevance both for the anthropogenic dust and the dust radiative effect. Uh, it, it's also important to understand absorption um, observations, uh, for instance, from Aeronet or satellites or in situ instruments, because it uh, interferes with our understanding of black carbon absorption, brown carbon, uh, organic carbon absorption. And then I, I want to show again uh, uh, something which we had done for several years now is this uh, analysis of uh, the variability in the different parts of the dust cycle. And uh, that led to some uh, questioning of the size distribution um, understanding in the models and a short note on uh, how big uh, the dust feedback, climate dust feedback can be uh, from this recent work with AirCamMIP. So uh, just uh, as a uh, start, uh, a simple comparison of this control simulation, um, seasonal cycle of the observed and uh, simulated optical depths, uh, the upper left total optical depths against Aeronet. So the thick curve is the Aeronet optical depth seasonal cycle at all sites in 2010 and co-located uh, the seasonal cycle from, from the models in this control simulation. So there's not dust, it's total AOD. To the right side, uh, the fine mode optical depths, which is uh, characteristic, uh, which, which is uh, not only anthropogenic, it has also a fine mode dust component and the fine mode sea salt components in some regions, fire um, may be seen as natural as well. And uh, in the lower part, you have the same type of comparison against satellite data. So what we have, uh, so that's a emerged uh, aerosol product of uh, different satellite uh, data from MODIS and uh, ATSR merged over for a period uh, from uh, for a historical period from which we took the year 2010. And then the fine mode is not available for many satellites, but uh, for the AATSR, Swansea University has uh, produced a fine mode estimate of AOD. So what we learn from that is that the models uh, underestimate optical depths, some more, some less. It's not, the scale is a bit different on the different graphs here. Uh, for the fine mode optical depths, it looks like on average, the models get it better, which is a sign of that uh, dust and sea salt are interfering with our understanding of AOD. We have to get the natural aerosol also correct for understanding the total AOD signal. And uh, the satellites, uh, because they have a different uh, coverage, uh, give a little different signal, but also here there's an underestimate of, of the models. Uh, which is quite uh, significant. And uh, for the fine mode, uh, probably because we have more sea areas uh, interfering here, uh, there's also now an underestimate, uh, which was not over land in the Aeronet network. For dust, um, you can make a, a, a separate inspection. So I took uh, just a dusty site, well, at least over part of the year, very dusty site, Tenerife. Um, and I plot here the, the Aerocom mean from actually from the Aeroval interf Metno interface. You can uh, retrieve these uh, comparisons yourself. Um, 
So the error mean is uh, averaging all these uh, error com models, uh, which contribute to the uh, phase three control experiment. And you see here that the, for the total AOD, uh, the models do reproduce this summer maximum and spring maximum of optical depths pretty well. Um, but then if you go to the course and the fine mode, uh, you see that the models underestimate the course mode AOD and they overestimate the fine mode actually at this dusty side. So for dust, uh, we, we may uh, conclude here that the models, uh, even from this very straightforward uh, comparison, um, underestimate course and put too much aerosol, dust aerosol in the fine mode something which came out also from other uh, investigations and I will come back to that. For the trends, um, this is just an illustration of uh, 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 the importance of that we need to understand also the, the dust trends. Um, we have started to, to in particular look into this uh, period from 2003 to 2020 because there are satellite data because there are um, more observations of surface scattering, PM, and Aeronet available. And uh, you see a map of the trends on the left side from, uh, from the CAM3 analysis using MODIS and other satellites to, to uh, steer the total aerosol component. You see some uh, negative trends also in the dust, dusty uh, areas uh, from this um, on this work, although they are, they are small, uh, you see some very negative trends in, in Europe and uh, Eastern US. And overall is quite a trend both in uh, global AOD um, and in the analysis um, at Aeronet sites. Uh, but interestingly, the, the trend in the comes analysis is smaller than in the observations at Aeronet sites. And uh, we are wondering why that is. Um, one attempt was to just focus on Europe and I'm showing European trends from, for different parameters um, as published by, by us and Augustin Mortier who worked uh, quite a bit on that uh, and compared to different models um, from Aerocom and some also from CMIP6 available at the time. Uh, for this period from 2000 to 2014. You see that the, in Europe, the, the trends observed uh, are uh, pretty similar to what is uh, simulated by many models, you know, minus 3% per year, quite a lot. Um, maybe the models underestimate this trend a bit. Um, for the coarse AOD, uh, you see that the scatter uh, or the uncertainty in this trend is pretty large, both in the models and in the, in the observations. And there is a bit um, a trend, which is a bit positive in the models, uh, but uh, it clearly points to uh, that the trend, the global AOD or the, the European AOD trend is uh, dominated by uh, fine AOD. Uh, there's also a uh, confirmation of that by there's a scattering trend here for some, at least for the observations, we hadn't had the data from some of the most of the models. Sulfate concentration had gone down, PM10 and P2.5 went down in this period. So we have an understanding of that um, uh, the anthropogenic and fine mode AOD went down in that time, while the, the dust. If um, um, the dust trends are much more uncertain, maybe we need a, a different analysis, different region, different focus uh, on this. And uh, for global and regional trends, this is certainly an interesting split to do. Uh, the, the other uh, component I wanted to uh, put some uh, light on is the absorption of the dust. Um, so there's a uh, analysis of absorption in global models in this AeroCom control experiment from Maria Sun from Cicero, recently published, which uh, uh, shows the, also the split into dust uh, organic 
aerosol and black carbon absorption optical depths. Uh, and you see here the, the variation in this dust optic absorption optical depth. So the absorption component of optical depths, um, which is uh, quite variable between the models. Uh, this diversity is a, a long featured uh, uh, thing uh, from all these model in the comparisons. Um, you see that they all have some uh, same latitudinal distribution. Dust is coming from uh, from the from the North African desert. Some Asian dust is popping up in some models. And um, the interesting uh, the interest in this uh, uh, dust absorption optics absorption optical depths uh, comes from this uh, compilation of. Uh, the contributions from black carbon, organic carbon, organic aerosol, and dust absorption to total absorption. You see here the split um, uh, to absorption optical depths from those three components um, for three wavelengths in uh, five models. And you see that dust uh, on average uh, contributes to global uh, AAOD almost. 20 to 50 percent at some wavelengths. Um, and that is because even though uh, we have a small mass absorption coefficient for dust, there's so much dust in the, in the atmosphere that on average uh, it uh, shows up as an important component of absorption. So to the upper right, you see this compilation from uh, Sumset et al, uh, also a bit revised in this uh, Sumset et al paper of uh, mass absorption coefficient as a function of, of wavelengths. And, and the lower green part is showing the dust, the estimate of the dust or the, the bounds of where the dust absorption uh, coefficient lies for different wavelengths. Uh, the brown uh, figure here is showing the brown carbon and um, and then the upper one is showing the different estimates for for uh, black carbon and there's a uh, three orders of magnitude between the dust absorption coefficient and the black carbon absorption coefficient but because of these uh, big amounts of dust uh, uh, when you multiply with the mass then you get to a distribution like this um the final figure from these uh, all these work uh, uh, is a little complicated. It, it shows the different processes uh, responsible for the variability and diversity of, of the models. But we had have done that for several years now, and it, it shows some some interesting things. So just to explain, um, we have uh, the the. the the properties of the model, the emissions, the lifetime of the dust, and the mass absorption coefficient, and the aerosol absorption optical depths uh, are normalized to some mean property. So on this, uh, this shows the variability of uh, the absorption optical depths. And to compare the different properties, which have different units, uh, uh, emissions are in teragram per year and lifetime is in days and the mass extinction coefficient is square meter per gram. Uh, it is useful to, to normalize the variability across the aerocom ensemble to some common value, which is the mean of the aerosol aerocom ensemble, and then uh, multiply with the mean AOD. So all this, you, you see from this figure, the contribution of the variability in emissions to total A AOD. So very simply said, this uh, the variability in the absorption optical depths is uh, half due to emission variabilities from the models. Uh, it shows also that the variability in the, or the, the, the contribution of lifetime differences between the models is larger to the variability in uh, AAOD than that of emissions. So in that sense, this uh, reflects that there is quite a lot of um, size and removal uh, variability among the models. 
uh, and uh, the optical properties are even more uncertain, at least uh, there are two models which have very high uncertainty in this uh, in these optical properties. So it's worth to investigate in several process investigate or invest in several processes and their refinement. It's not just an emission question to get uh, the optical absorption optical depths right. A similar analysis for uh, um, optical depths. Um, you see also here that the optical depths in the in the phase three was uh, plus minus 50% uh, among the, the models. And you see also here that the lifetime burden, the lifetime variability was larger than the emission uh, variability, 56% uh, standard deviation in emission uh, diversity among the AeroCon models. Um, one nice work uh, from all these inspection of uh, uh, AeroCon models and their size distributions came uh, some years ago out from group from Jasper Koch, uh, who uh, concluded that uh, the models probably missed some of this large part of the size spectrum. They emit too fine dust, uh, which uh, together with some other uh, observationally constrained uh, errors um, underestimates uh, this part of the, the spectrum, which has an effect mainly on the long wave to short wave uh, radiative effect split and leads to a smaller radiative uh, effect. This is consistent with that we, that we have this um, um, overestimation of fine mode and um, underestimation of coarse uh, mode for instance in Tenerife. Uh, and uh, if you, if you, if you, uh, do a net radiative effect of dust, uh, this uh, becomes uh, uh, almost much smaller than, than if you have a lot of uh, scattering uh, fine dust aerosols. And if you do, if you do then a, a further computation of the climate sensitivity of this, uh, which was um, done in the AirCam MIP experiments, compute the radiative effect of dust by making experiments uh, where the dust uh, emissions were doubled and uh, making experiments where uh, another climate was uh, simulated by using four times CO2 concentrations and multiply that, you get uh, a climate feedback factor for the different components for what that was tested. And for dust, because there is these counseling effects of um, of warming and, and cooling. Um, even though there are quite some changes in, in dust emissions, uh, the total climate feedback was uh, pretty small compared to other uh, factors investigated, uh, which uh, means in turn that um, this uh, computing the radiative effect of dust uh, is important because uh, if this would be a bit different, uh, then this factor would easily uh, get more larger. Uh, there were only very few models, uh, four models at that time uh, involved in this study. So uh, I think another set of models would, uh, and in the meantime, there are more models uh, would, would certainly give a different uh, radiative feedback factor uh, involving dust emissions. So uh, a little to what is currently going on uh, in the end. Um, an attempt of, or a, a motivation for Aerocom uh, since long was to uh, better constrain these aerosol effects. And I would say that there are maybe three um, branches which are, which are important uh, right now. So there's one attempt to uh, agree on uh, uh, aerosol properties which uh, models should respect. So uh, there was a suggestion to form a commission on constraining aerosol properties. Um, new table of aerosol optical uh, properties 
are about to emerge uh, with possibly model recommendations for uh, these different uh, properties. But then uh, there's uh, still a need for uh, studies which test the sensitivity of uh, the properties of a global uh, dust or aerosol model to, to the processes. Uh, so there are attempts to use multiple parameter perturbations, emulators. Um, of course, there are continued individual model studies, studies to test uh, sensitivity to process uh, uh, perturbations. Uh, and one attempt is also to um, focus more on exchanging aerosol code. Uh, there's a, a long-term um, diversity, uh, which doesn't go away in these aerosol models, which uh, is probably needs uh, a better inspection of the code themselves. Um, and for eliminating uh, traces and uh, the transport terms, uh, the idea is to also introduce more regular transport traces in the models. And of course, uh, uh, the scoring with observations is, uh, is a important part of all these efforts. Um, I think uh, this is a common sense. So I, I selected uh, for uh, proper for uh, activities to just uh, finish this up. Um, there's one initiative to inspect those dust sources uh, in the different regions. Um, maybe we have overlooked uh, some of the Asian sources. Then there is an opportunity to to understand the transatlantic dust better, and uh, there's an experiment. Uh, around that. And then uh, a word on this commission and a small advertisement on uh, an attempt to, to make uh, code exchange more easy. So I pick here slides from uh, Dong Shul uh, Kim from the last uh, workshop, the Aircom workshop. Uh, thanks uh, to Dong Shul. Um, so the idea in this experiment is to uh, to activate the different uh, source regions in, in experiments and identify the dust uh, cycle attached to each uh, dust region. And the regions are here shown uh, in the upper left. Uh, so for instance, the African sources, West African, East African, Baudelaire regions uh, are separated than the Middle East, Central Asia, East Asia, Taklamakan, Southern Hemisphere and North America. And uh, if you do this uh, um, in different models, uh, you will find that, of course, the global dust cycle is, is uh, different as, as we have seen before. Uh, emissions vary quite a bit. Uh, the loads uh, and lifetimes are different in the different models. And what is interesting is that the emissions uh, from these different regions um, are quite different in the different models. So the models use different uh, source maps. Uh, the wind uh, statistics are certainly different in the different models. The, the brown and light brown and yellow are the African uh, sources. And then we follow on with the Asian and then the blue one is uh, uh, South African, South American, and Australian sources. So you see that uh, these emissions are quite differently spread over the globe. Uh, so there is some uh, big uncertainty in where these dust emissions are really coming from, uh, which becomes clear from this, uh, from this uh, split. And then uh, when you go through the um, cycle from emission, uh, to loads, to optical depths, and attribute uh, from these uh, receptor runs uh, the dust optical depths uh, uh, belonging to a certain region. Uh, you see that the partitioning is actually not changing so much from emission to, to optical depths. So uh, for this, um, uh, the, the cakes look pretty similar from uh, going from emission 
to load to dust optical depths for a given model, indicating that um, the dust properties between the regions are within a given model very similar. So removal and um, size and uh, absorption coefficients are uh, in these models not so different in between regions. So the um, uh, emission repartitioning between the, the models makes the biggest difference for, for the global dust cycle here. Then uh, the transatlantic dust experiment, uh, which is also uh, not finalized, uh, and I uh, thank uh, Hong Min Yu for some slides here, uh, is uh, looking into specifically this uh, uh, dust plume from uh, North Africa or the Eastern Atlantic to the Caribbean, um, exploiting that there's a, a loss uh, along the transect and that uh, we have good observations uh, from satellites and also from some surface sites and Calliope in, the, in that region, which should constrain uh, aerosol uh, removal in particular. Um, and uh, there's also a nice uh, table, I'm not uh, asking you to read it, uh, of the trips of the models, which is meant to to better document uh, the differences in, in deposition and uh, size uh, characteristics in the models. And um, the result is that um, you see here dust optical depths from the different models from uh, Calliope, Modis, and, uh, and uh, Mara reanalysis um, against uh, Aerocom models. And uh, to the left, uh, the average for these three boxes, North Africa, the Eastern Atlantic Ocean, and then the more Western Caribbean Sea um, dust optical depths from the models. And uh, you see a decrease in this uh, dust optical depths. If you look carefully on the, on the scale here in the bottom uh, from uh, 0.3 to 0 0.0, too far away in the West. Interestingly, the diversity increases uh, from uh, North Africa to uh, the Caribbean, so indicating that uh, these removal processes uh, increased uh, initially uh, similar fields. Um, so uh, the further attempts uh, are underway to, to understand uh, uh, where, which removal is, is uh, creating this uh, diversity. Here's an attempt to estimate from the satellite uh, and from the models, the median uh, deposition in the Eastern Atlantic Ocean and in the Caribbean Sea. There's some uh, differences in the seasonality um, and uh, more striking is maybe this figure where you see the vertical profiles of optical depths or extinction, dust extinction over North Africa, which are uh, from Kaliop in black estimated with some error bar around and uh, model profiles uh, and the logarithmic uh, altitude range uh, up to six, seven kilometer you find dust. And then uh, the same comparison over the Eastern uh, Atlantic and over the Caribbean. And uh, interestingly, the, it looks like um, there's more dust staying in the, in the atmosphere as seen by Calliope uh, than in the models, which would mean that um, actually we would need some fine dust uh, or some uh, increased uh, lifetime of coarse dust to survive until uh, to the until the the west, so that's a little in contradiction to what we have uh, found uh, from other comparisons. Um, and uh, a final figure from Hongbin I took is uh, this comparison of the old uh, Aerocom Phase One model diversity for different properties of the dust uh, as compared to the Phase Three, um, and there is. Um, 
in, an, an increase in diversity in these recent models, in particular because some models have uh, included uh, more coarse uh, aerosols, um, more coarse dust aerosols. And if you remove them, uh, then uh, the models actually have a slightly lower diversity, but there's clearly still uh, quite an uh, uncertainty in, in the dust life cycle um, due to this um, removal processes and exception of the, of the aerosol size. So uh, that brings me to the last two attempts, which are currently ongoing. Um, so one is uh, this uh, commission, uh, which is uh, about to collect information on, on uh, bounds for different properties of the aerosols. Um, so this figure is just maybe an illustration of what we, we seek to do. Um, the idea is to have bounds on properties, um, uh, which should uh, be, which should give a, a, a constraint for, for models and also satellite retrievers when they uh, produce global aerosol loads and optical property uh, maps and, uh, and uh, which should be um, an indication of uh, looking into models if they, if they do something uh, very different. Uh, but the second uh, uh, part for Aerocom is certainly that we also have to look into code. Um, I started to make a small compilation of which codes are available and, and ready for inspection. Uh, just to, to give you an idea, not all code is publicly available of aerosols. So uh, some are in GitHub uh, repositories, others are uh, available on request or but we have to establish some um, cooperation to, to, to understand really uh, which aerosol properties are uh, relevant in a different model, in a specific model. So the second part of that uh, idea is really to, was initiated uh, now recently by Natalie Mauwald and colleagues uh, in the US to, to think about uh, um, general requirements uh, for interfaces between the different parts of an aerosol code, aerosol chemistry interfaces, uh, which uh, is proposed to uh, be discussed in a workshop uh, in the near future, in February, uh, which should uh, allow um, more flexible testing of modules and uh, parts of the aerosol code by uh, exchanging on, on how this can be uh, done in a more general way. Uh, it's very hard to, to move uh, code from one model to another today. And that hinders uh, some understanding of why the models are so different. With that, uh, I would like to thank for your attention and uh, already for questions. I'm ready. Thanks a lot, Michael. The audience is, is coming. Um, we have a question in the questions and answer box from Santiago Gasso. Yes. Santiago, uh, you are our first upgraded uh, participant. And then you can, if you prefer, you can. I am searching you now. Uh, I will promote you as a panelist, then you can as directly to Mikael, uh, the question that you type in the box. Also for the rest of the audience, meanwhile, uh, Santiago is adapting everything to, to can talk with him directly. Uh, if you want to also launch a question to Mikael, you can raise your hand and uh, we will take care of your questions, okay? In any time, you can also write in the in the box. Then feel free to start to launch your questions. Santiago, it's your turn. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thanks so much for the honor to be the first panelist in this. Maybe the and the first of the year. That's 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 very touching. Thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, yeah, I mean. You know, Michael, the uh, 
comparison models and satellites, uh, you know, until recently, all the data we have is from a single picture per day, or maybe two pictures per day from the satellites. And, the, and, and now, you know, we're going to have geostationary sometime soon, hopefully. And you can do the same kind of comparisons. So what I wonder is, uh, what is your expectation in terms of what what you think is going to be improved uh, in in these in the terms of comparisons, like the ones you you've been doing? Yeah, that's the question. I guess uh, if you we, we have seen some uh, episodes which which uh, of dust coming in from uh, North Africa to Europe and. Uh, assimilated by by um, by the IFS model and then within comes it's true that uh, if you look carefully that, that the plume the arrival of the plume is is um, sometimes a bit before or after the real plume from surface observations and I guess if 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 we had uh, satellite observations of yeah as you say uh, yeah hourly resolution that would change this assimilation and the, uh, the precision of, of, of getting to where the dust and came from and where the plume really originated. I think that will improve for sure. Um, yeah, it would be interesting if that helps. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I guess the uh, the observation is, is the point that now we have uh, with geostationary, you have the uh, time uh, variability and and we are still in these comparisons we are still struggling i mean and correct me if i'm wrong we're still struggling to make uh, differentiation if what the variability observed is because dynamics or you know some microphysical properties that you are considering and and i wonder if yeah. it, i'm assuming that geo will help you to you know separate those effects you know because you have the time component yeah I think when we, sh if you are interested, I think there's also um, Nick Schutkin's work of uh, trying to co-locate uh, uh, the aerosol satellite information more in detail with with the uh, three hourly output from the models, and it makes a difference. Um, um, I think. Uh, the other attempt Nick has recently done is to uh, to interpolate, uh, to, to make a better comparison <laughs> strategy to, to fill the gaps in between, in between what is not observed. Um, so uh, I think that's uh, ongoing work altogether, especially for dust, I, I would think would be interesting. I think any higher resolved uh, data will, of course, uh, uh, get us out of the dark, what, what, is, what variability is in that in that part. I mean, so now we can just compare to what is uh, there on, on, on days with uh, where we can observe the dust. Also, Aeronet doesn't observe all the time. I mean, we may miss some right. very dusty days. We miss maybe you know, the days when there was clouds and dust. So right. um, there might be a bias just because of that. OK, thank you. You're muted. Paul Gino is now the participant that is upgrade to panelist. And then Paul, if you are there, uh, you can you can directly allow. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi, Michael. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sloban. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so you show that the, the dust absorption, optical depth variability is the largest and is mostly due to um, the optical property used for dust, correct? Yes. Okay, so there is now a large effort um, to try to improve that by including mineralogy. As you are aware, there will be a, a launch in May to um, 
map uh, the mineralogy of the soil of the deserts, do you think this will decrease this variability? Did we, this will improve, better constrain the optical property or the opposite? Because it's not, <laughs> it's not trivial mm -hmm. to uh, include uh, correctly uh, these uh, different minerals when you calculate the refractive index. What, what is your uh, point of view on that? Thanks. Well, I mean, there is no way around uh, understanding, probably. There's, for instance, uh, uh, different uh, source regions for more or less absorbing dust. I think that that's, uh, I think, important to know because otherwise the models would assume the same absorption wherever it comes from. Um, I think there's one step to be made from uh, getting that information maybe uh, better simulated in one model to uh, to using that information in, in, in all the relevant dust models because they might not pick up this information because it's computationally too heavy. So um, I'm not sure it will help right away, but uh, I would be interesting. I think it's a, also a, a long long-standing activity to get to this mineralogy and have some models producing that mineralogy uh, as a transported dust field. Um, yes, I think it could be a good subject for an in-dust seminar. Yes. Yeah, in fact, there is a webinar from Carlos Perez that uh, you can find in the, in the series, if it was in June, if, if I'm not wrong where it is starting to discuss the, the mineralogy. Uh, we have another participant that wants to raise a question for you. It's Claire, Claire Rader, that is here. Hi. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. And we can see you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really fascinating um, talk. Thank you. I, I had a question about um, figure where you showed how the emissions have changed a lot in the phase three ericom because many models are using a larger size range of particles um so i was wondering is there any difference in how well or how badly the models which have included those larger particles agree with the observations um or any general improvement in those those models which have made that move I think that is missing that analysis. I think the only thing what was so far uh, clear was if you do include this very coarse models, very coarse aerosol, you of course change the um, the dust cycle quite a bit because you have different sedimentation properties of the average dust. Um, yeah. So uh, I think these simulations with include this super coarse dust they are responding in a way to all these observations which, <laughs> which you and others made. Uh, and uh, I think that's, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's why I was picking up to this size issue a little because I think there's quite some uncertainty. It's not totally consistent, I think. Like, I don't understand this uh, Atlantic, transatlantic dust so well. If, if we need even more coarse dust, uh, <laughs> How do we get it over the Atlantic? Uh, I think it should be, it's an interesting discussion how to make this uh, consistent. Uh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Initial dust distribution and the vertical distribution and how long it is transported. Yeah, okay, thank you. Maybe there's some uh, coarse dust uh, formed along, uh, along transport in clouds uh, or through clustering it together, I don't know. Have, uh, yeah, I think that that's a possibility. In fact, there are some papers by a Spanish group, I think, who have some observations of that happening. Yeah. Um, and the, these tiny dust particles kind of form in clouds and they almost form a donut shape of a much larger particle, which is fascinating. Um, but they're very limited observations. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's really important to have some work into the processes of what's going on to keep the, the coarser particle in the atmosphere over that long distance. But I don't have any answers at the moment. <laughs> Thanks a lot. 
Claire. Um, there is a long comment for you but from Michael Brad brother from I'm not really sure, but he knows you because it's good to see you again. Can you see the, the chat, right? Yes. In any case, um, there is no special question, I would say. There are some comments. Then uh, I don't know if you want to to add anything or to. It's um, basically related to the code used by the models involved in IDOCOM. And some of them, also Ina has mentioned that uh, Hamo's uh, model will be very soon yeah. open access code. Then uh, is there any special effort inside IDOCOM to really push that the, all models will have this code open and? Well, I mean, that is, um, that's what I just said. I mean, mm. there's this idea it's a long-standing idea to, to exchange code. It's quite some work. Uh, who's funding that? Uh, who's looking into code from other models? Um, but uh, I, I guess it's to a certain extent needed. Maybe dust is the easiest, easiest of all this because it's uh, not participating in chemistry so much. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, a secondary aerosol formation. Uh, constituent like uh, organic aerosols and sulfate. So it's, it's a bit easier in a way. So maybe that could be one attempt to exchange uh, uh, surface uh, maps uh, used for emissions, um, sedimentation, uh, different ways of uh, formulating size bins. And um, I think there are quite some individual solutions around. Yeah, it's one of the easiest, right? It's also non English copy. <clears throat> Paul, do you want to say something? No. No. Okay. Um, I can see uh, more questions from the audience. Wait. Uh, yeah, there are questions. Uh, I don't know if Terry Keating, do you want to raise your question directly to the to Mikael, I will give you voice if you want to ask him directly your question. Sure. Yeah. Um, this is Terry. Hi, Michael. Um, enjoy, very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I was just wondering if you could say more about what is known about what drives the variability in dust emissions estimates. I was surprised by the um, significant variability across the different models. And I was wondering if it's, is it tied to um, the underlying data about soil and land cover and soil moisture and things like that? Or is it also, um, it, it, is it due to different assumptions about the dust generation and entrainment processes? Uh, I think that's a bit the work uh, which Dong Shu Kim is currently undertaking. Uh, so I can only guess. My guess is that the, that the soil properties and the, the soil maps are quite different in between the models. Um, so the areas in which dust can be generated uh, multiplied with the wind uh, distribution then makes quite a difference. Yeah. Um, so whatever you put in as um, erodible area, I think makes a big difference. But it's uh, more a guess, I think. It, uh, it will be certainly also moderated by the wind distribution. I think a higher resolution model has uh, more high winds and will, will then also create more dust. So there's a fraction which is resolution dependent. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Mikael, and the last last question, because it's four o'clock, then we are late, is the Mian team. Mian, I will give you voice right now, just in case you want to ask directly to Mikael your question. Uh, yes. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Good to see you um, again. Um, I just wonder if you could uh, summarize the the progress we made uh, in these 20 some years for the ARACOM modeling uh, of dust uh, from ARACOM 
phase one to phase three. And in addition, how do you project in the project into the future if, if there's any hope that we could reduce the diversity of the models? Now I have to be positive, right? Um, <laughs> no, you don't have to. You just have to be objective. <laughs> no, I think, I think uh, actually, I think this assimilation um, of uh, the satellite data gives us a better reference. Uh, I think we, we, we have much better observations. We have a, a better understanding of uh, trends of dust. I think uh, a lot of models um, show very little trend in dust. Um, but then uh, there was a paper recently saying that there's a doubling of dust uh, since pre-industrial. So where should it come from? Um, I think we, we learned about this uh, uh, contradictions in size. I think uh, there's some hints that uh, the models miss some coarse dust, um, which we haven't had in the beginning. Um, I think uh, the constraints for absorption from this thorough analysis of uh, uh, absorption in Aeronet is, is uh, giving us a better constraint. I think the models haven't picked up some of this uh, constraints. And I think that's probably what has to be done. I think that's why it's worth to look into the code and formulate some constraints uh, from the observations, uh, what models should respect. Other than that, I think you're much more into formulating progress. <laughs> I think that's a positive. Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot, Michael, for your time and for giving us this nice talk about Irocom because it was a really nice overview of this. How many? 20 years, you said? No, 10, 10. Mm -hmm. A long time ago. And um, uh, I don't want, I don't know if you want to add any other. No, question. Thanks, for your attention. thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for your time. I know that you are super busy, then I hope that the participants will appreciate this webinar. At least I, it was super exciting for me. Um, thanks a lot, Ernest and Nitschko, to be always my co-chairs of these webinars. And uh, just for before to say goodbye, I want to Sorry, I want to announce our next webinar. It will be a very different topic, let's say, is about uh, the use of the information that we provide with models and observations for creating dust warning systems for public health is, a, is an example of Puerto Rico. And our invited speaker is Pablo Mendez Lázaro from the University of Puerto Rico. And he will overview some projects that are ongoing now and, post proje and past projects that are also coordinated with NASA. And uh, a last thing that I want to mention is that tomorrow there is an event that is the launch of the new website of the Barcelona DAS Regional Center is at three Central European time. It's just one hour event, it's virtual and you are invited to be part of this event. And you will have all the information for register to be to register to the event through the website, but also Twitter. And if you are very quick now and you can do a screenshot of the barcode, you can also use the barcode where you can go directly to the registration link. And with it, if you will join tomorrow to this event, we will see you tomorrow. And if not, I will wait for you, remember, uh, next month, 16 February at three with the new webinar of, the, of this series of DAST webinars. Then thanks a lot to all of you to be here today. And I hope that you will have a nice afternoon. Then see you. Bye. Bye-bye.